Welcome to Hydrogeology 101 Key Concepts. Today we're going to look at the flow of groundwater in the subsurface. There are two main things which control groundwater movements. These are the hydraulic gradient and the permeability of the subsurface. We'll look at both of these terms and then see how they work together in Darcy's Law. Finally, we'll have a look at some of the applications of Darcy's Law. Okay, let's start with the hydraulic gradient. The hydraulic gradient is the slope of the water table. Like any slope, it is calculated by dividing the change in the water elevation by the horizontal distance. If we have two wells, as shown here, we can measure the difference in their water levels if we know the elevations of the wells above a datum, usually mean sea level. So if we have our mean sea level down here, what we want to know is what is the elevation of each well above mean sea level. So that's this distance here. And then we measure our depth to the static water level, like this. And we end up with the elevation of the water table. So here's the elevation of the first water table. And here's the elevation of our second water table. And then delta H will be the difference in the water elevations between the two wells. And delta L is the horizontal distance between them. The hydraulic gradient, which is usually shown as small i, is delta H divided by delta L. Notice that as both delta H and delta L are in meters, when we divide one by the other, I becomes dimensionless. Let's say you park your car on this hill slope and forget to put on the handbrake. Well, it's going to roll down the slope and end up in the river. The same is true for groundwater. It floats from areas of high water levels to areas of low water levels. We say that groundwater flows from areas of high hydraulic head to areas of low hydraulic head along the steepest hydraulic gradient. It is therefore the hydraulic gradient which drives groundwater flow. If the hydraulic gradient is totally flat, i.e. zero, there would be no groundwater flow. Therefore, the hydraulic gradient is extremely important to keep the groundwater flowing. The second important factor which controls the speed at which groundwater flows through the subsurface is the permeability. Permeability is the ability of a rock or sediment to transmit a fluid. Let's imagine that we have three cylinders filled with gravel, sand and silt. And we're going to fill them up with water and then let the water drain away. You'll notice that the gravel drains very quickly and the sand will drain a little bit more slowly while the silt takes quite a long time to drain. We say that the gravel has a high permeability whereas that of the sand and the silt is lower. Let's do a permeability experiment with one of our cylinders filled with sand. You'll notice that there is a source of water here on the left, and this water can flow along the cylinder and out the other end, where we'll measure it in this bucket here. We have two tubes here, one at the beginning of the cylinder and one towards the end, where we're going to measure the water pressure inside the tube, or the hydraulic head. At the beginning of our experiment, our valve here is closed, which means there's no water flowing through the tube, and the water pressure is the same in both tubes. Now, when we open our valve, the water will start to come out of our tube, and you'll notice that there is now a difference in water pressure between the two tubes. A hydraulic gradient has been set up, and some water has started to come out of the tube and into our bucket. We can plot the discharge against the hydraulic gradient on, on this chart here on the left. Remember the hydraulic gradient is delta H divided by delta L. And you'll see we have a, a point which plots here. Now we're going to increase the head in the beginning of our tube 
that means our hydraulic gradient is increasing and also there's a correspondent increase in discharge. Let's plot the point. And you'll see it falls a bit higher up on our graph because discharge has increased as has the hydraulic head. Finally, we've increased our hydraulic gradient even more and the discharge through our uh, cylinder has increased to a maximum. And if we plot that point, you'll see that all these three points appear to plot on a straight line. The straight line means that there's a proportional relationship between discharge and the hydraulic gradient. We can express this as a formula with discharge equals k times hydraulic gradient. The k is the constant of proportionality. It is the slope of our straight line and it is also the permeability of the material. In our permeability experiment, we've been measuring the discharge at various hydraulic gradients. The discharge is a volumetric flow rate, which means that it has units of volume over time, in this case cubic meters per day. The discharge has to pass through the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. If we divide the discharge by the area, we will obtain a volumetric flow rate per unit area, and this is known as the hydraulic flux. Here's the equation for it. Small q equals discharge divided by area. Our discharge here is measured in units of cubic meters per day, and our area is in meters squared. So if we divide cubic meters per day by meters squared, we end up with meters per day, which is a velocity. The hydraulic flux is also mentioned in the literature under different names, for example, the Darcy flux or the specific discharge. But don't worry, they all mean the same thing. The hydraulic flux is a velocity, as we mentioned earlier, but we have to be very careful that we do not confuse the hydraulic flux with the groundwater velocity. They are not the same thing. If our pipe here was filled only with water, then the speed of water down this pipe would be the same as the hydraulic flux. However, if you think about an aquifer, it is full of aquifer material, and that means that the amount of volume that is available for groundwater to flow in is much reduced. In order to calculate the groundwater velocity, we first of all have to know what the porosity is of the aquifer, and then we use this formula, which is hydraulic flux divided by porosity. In our previous permeability experiment, we were plotting discharge against hydraulic gradient. We can also plot the hydraulic flux against hydraulic gradient, and we'll get a similar straight line relationship as shown here. The slope of this relationship is the hydraulic conductivity of the material. It's usually expressed as capital K, and it has units of length over time, for example, meters per day. The relationship is expressed as the hydraulic flux Q equals minus Ki, where K is the hydraulic conductivity and I is the hydraulic gradient. This is also known as Darcy's law of 1856. Henri Darcy was the first person to look at flow in porous media and he worked in Dijon, France. Remember that the hydraulic flux equals the discharge divided by the area, so we can rearrange the equation as Q equals minus Kia. Notice the minus sign in the equation. 
It is there to show you the direction of groundwater flow, which is assumed to be from left to right. It's very important to remember that Darcy's law is valid for laminar flow only. It does not apply to turbulent flow. We could rerun our permeability experiment using different materials. Gravel has a high hydraulic conductivity and would get quite a steep slope, where sand and silt would form more gentle slopes. You can see that the permeability or the hydraulic conductivity of the material depends to a large extent on the grain size of the material. Here are some typical values of hydraulic conductivity from Kruzman and Derrida, which you can download for free from the internet. Let's have a look at gravel, which has a K of 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3. That means 100 to 1000 meters per day. That's pretty high. But let's say that our gravel was mixed with medium sand. Then the medium sand would be the one which is determining the overall hydraulic conductivity of the material. In that case, it would only be between 5 and 20 meters per day. Okay, let's summarize Darcy's law, which we have explored using our permeability experiment. The very important formulas that you need to remember are these two here. Q equals KIA and small q equals KI. Uh, don't forget the minus sign in front. The hydraulic gradient is the driving force behind the groundwater flow and is measured as delta H over delta L. We also need to know the hydraulic conductivity of the formation and, of course, the area through which the groundwater flows. And then we can calculate the discharge and the hydraulic flux using our formulas. Let's see how Darcy's law is applied in the real world. This was our experimental setup. Let's change that to something that looks a bit more like the real world because Darcy's law applies in the real world as much as it does in the laboratory. Let's change that to look a bit more like an aquifer and remind ourselves of the key parameters we need to know in order to calculate Darcy's law. The first one is the hydraulic conductivity of the aquifer, the hydraulic gradient, and of course the cross-sectional area through which the groundwater has to flow. Let's illustrate this with a real example. We have an aquifer here with a thickness of 30 meters. It has a width of a thousand meters. So let's calculate the area through which the groundwater has to flow, which is 1000 meters times by 30 meters, which equals 30,000 square meters. That is the area, the cross-sectional area perpendicular to groundwater discharge. We have two boreholes. One has a water level age elevation of 1,850 meters. One has an elevation of 1,750 meters, which means that we have a delta H of minus 100 meters. The distance between the boreholes is 25 kilometers. So our hydraulic gradient will be minus 100 divided by 25,000, which is minus 0 0.004. Just to remind you, the negative sign means that groundwater is flowing from the left to the right. Our hydraulic conductivity is 100 meters per day, which is quite high. You'd expect that in a gravel, for example. And now we can calculate the discharge going through the aquifer using our formula, Darcy's law, Q equals minus KIA. So we need to know the hydraulic conductivity, which is 100 meters per day, the hydraulic gradient, which is minus 0 0.004, and the area, which is 30,000 square meters. Times it all together, and we end up with 12,000 cubic meters per day.
That sounds like a lot of water. But how fast is the groundwater actually flowing? To calculate that, we can also use Darcy's law. The hydraulic flux, Q, equals minus Ki. So that is 100 meters per day times by the hydraulic gradient of minus 0 0.004. And we end up with a hydraulic flux of 0 0.4 meters per day. Remember that the hydraulic flux is the discharge flowing perpendicular to the cross-sectional area divided by the cross-sectional area. It's not the same as the groundwater velocity. To calculate the groundwater velocity, we also need to know the porosity, or more correctly, the effective porosity of the aquifer. In this case, it's 0 0.3. And our formula is the hydraulic flux divided by the porosity, or 0 0.4 divided by 0 0.3, and we end up with 1.33 meters per day. This is quite typical of the kind of speeds at which groundwater moves through aquifers. Remember that groundwater flows very slowly, unlike surface water. Let's look at some of the common permeability units that we use in hydrogeology. If we have a aquifer with a hydraulic gradient of minus one that means that if we had two boreholes one meter apart we would see a one meter drop in head between them then the amount of water that would discharge from a one by one square meter area perpendicular to the flow is our hydraulic conductivity, which we talked about earlier when we looked at Darcy's law. The hydraulic conductivity is therefore the, how many cubic meters a day we have passing through a square meter of area. And if you divide that out, you end up with meters per day. The transmissivity is the volume of water that would flow through the entire thickness of the aquifer if we have a section one meter wide. So basically the transmissivity equals the hydraulic conductivity times by the aquifer thickness. And that's why the units of transmissivity are in square meters per day. Let's see how that would apply to our previous example. Remember that Darcy's formula, Q equals minus Kia, and also at our transmissivity equals K times B, hydraulic connectivity times by the aquifer thickness. Remember before we had a K of 100 meters per day times it by a thickness of 30 meters and now our transmissivity is 3000 meters squared per day. Our area here, A, equals the aquifer width times the aquifer thickness. So we get rid of the K and the B and we put T into this formula and you'll see that the discharge Q equals minus TIW, so minus 3000 meters squared per day, times by minus 0 0.004, times by the aquifer width, which is 1000 meters, and we end up with the same answer of 12,000 cubic meters per day. It's much more common to have transmissivity data in hydrogeology than to have hydraulic conductivity data and we usually calculate it from pumping tests. I hope that you enjoyed this short video and thank you for your attention.